Hello, welcome to BEH 217 Behavioral Approaches. In today's presentation, we will be discussing psychoanalysis and psychoanalytically oriented therapy. So, you cannot even begin to understand psychoanalysis without bringing Freud into this because his psychoanalytic system is a model of personality development and an approach to psychotherapy. It provides practitioners with a conceptual framework for looking at behavior and for understanding the origins and functions of symptoms. He called attention to psychodynamic factors that motivate behavior, focusing on the role of the unconscious, and that's a very important element, so kind of underline that piece in your mind, and developing the first therapeutic procedures for understanding and modifying the structure of one's basic character. In today's environment, we often do a lot of self-thinking. We think about ourselves, we think about our choices, but if you think a hundred years ago when people were, um, you know, really in Freud's era, there wasn't a lot of self-reflection as much as there is today. So. You know, this idea of looking at the unconscious, the subconscious, was in a sense revolutionary. Freud's theory is a benchmark against which many other theories are measured. Many of these basic concepts are still part of the foundation on which other theorists build and develop their ideas. And Freud's views continue to influence contemporary practice. So, you know, despite the fact that a lot of people kind of see Freud as obsessed with sex and, and stuff like that, you know, he's still very important in the world of psychotherapy. According to Freud, our behavior is determined by irrational forces, unconscious motivations, and biological and instinctual drives as these evolve through key psychosexual stages in the first six years of life. Instincts are central to the Freudian approach. Instincts are those things that we don't consciously think about but are there. So instinctually we know we're hungry, instinctually we know we're cold, instinctually we know we're attracted to someone. In Freud's view both sexual and aggressive drives are powerful determinants of why people act as they do. Libido refers to sexual energy and Freud later broadened it to include the energy of all the life instincts. These instincts serve the purpose of the survival of the individual and the human race. They are oriented toward growth, development, and creativity. Freud also hypothesizes death instincts which account for our aggressive drive. Freud's structure of personality, which, again, so important in terms of psychoanalytic theory, consists of three systems. The id, which is present at birth. It is the demanding child in the original system of personality. The id is ruled by the pleasure principle, which means that the needs are based on immediate gratification. These needs are largely unconscious outside of the baby's awareness, such as hunger, a wet diaper, or being cold. Then as we come out of the womb and we start interacting with our families and our parents, we become aware of the ego, which is the traffic cop, and this is ruled by our reality principle. The ego is the seat of intelligence and rationality and it checks and controls the blind impulses of the id. The superego, which we develop much later as we grow older, is the judge. It includes a person's moral code, the main concern being whether an action is good or bad, right or wrong. So age five or six, you know, you hit your little brother, your mom yells at you, don't hit your brother, that's bad. Well, now your superego is learning what is considered okay and what is not okay. 
Freud's greatest contributions are his concepts of the unconscious and the levels of consciousness which are the keys to understanding behavior and the problems of personality. Clinical evidence for describing the unconscious includes dreams, slips of the tongue, which actually now are referred to as Freudian slips, post-hypnotic suggestions, material derived from free association techniques, and from projective techniques, and the symbolic content of psychotic symptoms. The unconscious stores all experiences, memories, and repressed material. The aim of psychoanalytic therapy is to make unconscious motives conscious, because only then can an individual exercise choice. Understanding the role of the unconscious is central to grasping the essence of the psychoanalytic model of behavior. So again, that unconscious is where everything resides in our mind that explains all our behaviors, according to Freud anyway. He also looked at anxiety, and it's also an essential to the psychoanalytic approach to its concept of anxiety. Anxiety is a feeling of dread that results from repressed feelings, memories, desires, and experiences that emerge to the surface of awareness. It develops out of a conflict among the id, ego, and superego over control of the psychic energy. The function of anxiety is to warn of impending danger, and there are three kinds of anxiety. Number one, reality anxiety is the fear of danger from the external world. So you're walking down the street and you see um, someone coming towards you and it appears that they are carrying a very large knife. Well, that is definitely a fear of danger. Neurotic anxiety is the fear that the instincts will get out of hand and cause the person to do something for which she or he will be punished. So, you know, if you are worried that you're not going to be able to control yourself in a crowd and you're going to rip off all your clothes and run around naked, that's neurosis. That's an anxiety that's neurotic. And then moral anxiety is the fear of one's own conscious, conscience, meaning you're anxious that you are violating your moral code. Ego defense mechanisms help the individual cope with anxiety and prevent the ego from being overwhelmed. Ego defenses are normal behaviors that can have adaptive value provided they do not become a style of life to avoid reality. Now again, just to remind you, ego for Freud is that rational side of our brain. In modern day language, ego is that sense of I'm awesome and everyone else is not as good as me. So you want to keep in mind the difference between the two meanings. We're talking about the Freudian ego. Defense mechanisms have two characteristics in common. They either deny or distort reality and they operate on an unconscious level. So I'm going to go over several common defense mechanisms and these are probably pretty familiar to some of you. Some of these will be more familiar to you than others because, you know, we all engage in a little defense mechanism once in a while. It's not a bad thing. It only gets to be a bad thing if we use them too much and we use them to avoid the reality of our lives. So we'll start with repression, which is threatening or painful thoughts and feelings are excluded from awareness. So um, this happens a lot of times when children are sexually abused when they're young, four or five years old, and their brains literally repress the information and the child grows up to become an adult and doesn't understand why they have problems with their sexuality. They go to a therapist and they discover that that missing chunk of time from when they were five was when they were being um, abused by an uncle or a family member. Then we have denial. 
which is closing one's eyes to the existence of a threatened aspect of reality. We're all in denial at some point. You know, you're driving down the road at 80 miles an hour. You know you're driving too fast. And you know that there's a chance you can get pulled over by the cops, but it doesn't stop us. Most of us do drive at least 10 miles over the speed limit. And, um, you know, there's the old saying, uh, denial is more than a river in Egypt. Reaction formation. This is one that's not as popularly thrown about. And this is actively expressing the opposite impulse when confronted with a threatening impulse. For example, a person who is angry with a colleague actually ends up being particularly courteous and friendly towards them. So you're so mad at them and you don't want them to know how mad you are, so you're overly nice to them instead. So that reaction, you formed it and it's not legitimate. Projection, attributing others one's own unacceptable desires and impulses. So if somebody says, wow, you're kind of mean, and then you respond, no, you're the mean one. Well, that's projection. Displacement, directing energy toward another object or person when the original object or person is inaccessible. So you come home from work, you've had a lousy day, your boss yelled at you, and you're six-year-old comes up to you and is like, hi daddy, hi mommy, can we play a game? And you're like, you just let loose on them and you just read them the riot act, you make them cry, and then you feel terrible because what you've done is you've realized that you've taken all your anger and aggression towards your boss and displaced it onto your child. Even for people when they displace their anger onto inanimate objects, you know, a lot of people like to punch a wall when they're really angry and it's directing that anger towards that object, that wall, to, you know, ex expunge that feeling without it being socially inappropriate, i.e. punching your boss. Then we have rationalization, which is manufacturing good reasons to explain away a bruised ego. So. Uh, someone goes up to you, a guy or a girl at a bar, asks them if they would like to dance, the person says no, and you walk back to your friends and say, they have a boyfriend, they have a girlfriend, they're, they're mean, whatever. You always come up with some reason why you ended up not being with that person. Then we have sublimation, which is diverting sexual or aggressive energy into other channels. So, you know, you get a lot of young people who have all these hormones rolling around inside of them and we try to channel it in more socially acceptable ways like sports and we send our young men and young women out onto, you know, the lacrosse field or the football field or the basketball court to try and get some of that energy out because otherwise, Lord only knows what they're going to get up to. Well, we all know what they're going to get up to because we were all young and we were all getting up to that stuff. Regression, we go back to an earlier phase of development when there were fewer demands. So something terrible happens and you have an overwhelming desire to uh, smoke a cigarette and you haven't smoked in years. Well, that's an oral compulsion. You want to, it's almost like having a baby bottle back. Um, the idea behind regression is you just don't want to have to deal with it. Introjection is taking in and swallowing the values and standards of others. Children of verbally abusive parents will often begin to believe that they are worthless because their parents tell them they are. So believing what somebody who's important says about you becomes this introjection. You're injecting this negative information into your own consciousness. Identification, you begin identifying with successful causes, organizations, or people in the hope that you'll be perceived as worthwhile. So you get a lot of people who have addiction issues and they start going to AA or NA and they suddenly become the greatest AA person ever and they will start spouting, you know, platitudes, meeting makers make it, which is not to undermine anyone's sobriety, but 
they get obnoxious about it because it's the first time they feel like they are worthwhile in a really long time. Then we have compensation, which is part of that Adlerian theory. Masking perceived weaknesses or developing certain positive traits to make up for limitations. And I have a little joke over here. Compensation, you bought the big gun because neither you or your wife were happy with your small gun. And obviously, gun is being used metaphorically for a body part. Um, you know, a lot of women look at a guy's car and if he's got a car that's just kind of ridiculous, it's it's ridiculously expensive or there's ridiculous rims and you always say they're making up for some lacking attribute um, and it's the same thing with women you know um, women compensate all all over the place you know a woman who doesn't physically have the kind of attributes a man would be interested in might compensate by becoming especially funny or um, dyeing her hair or getting implants so now we're going to move on to the development of personality. And we're going to talk about is Freud's theory of early development, which is really the first three stages. There's five total stages, but we're only looking at three in this presentation. The psychosexual sexual stages refer to the Freudian chronological phases of development beginning in infancy. Freud postulated three early stages of development that often lead people to counseling when these stages have not been appropriately resolved. First we have the oral stage and this is ages birth to 18 months when babies explore their environment with their mouth. So you put anything near a baby, they grab it, they put it in their mouths. Doesn't matter if it's keys, a lollipop, or a finger which deals with their inability to trust oneself and others resulting in the fear of loving and forming close relationships and low self-esteem. At the anal stage, which is 18 months to three years when a child is potty training, deals with the inability to recognize and express anger leading to the denial of one's own power as a person and the lack of a sense of autonomy or independence. Third is the phallic stage, ages three to six, when a child is fascinated by their opposite gender parent, which deals with the inability to fully accept one's sexuality and sexual feelings, and also difficulty in accepting oneself as a man or woman. And, you know, when you interview, um, gay people or transgender people, they will say they remember as far back as four, five, six years old feeling different than the other people in their peer group. So, you know, take that for what it is. According to the Freudian psychoanalytic view, these areas of personal and social development, i.e. love, trust, dealing with negative feelings, and developing a positive acceptance of sexuality are all grounded in the first six years of life. This period is the foundation on which later personality development is built. When a child's needs are not adequately met during these stages of development, an individual may become fixated at that stage and behave in psychologically immature ways later on in life. So let's take a moment to address Eric Erickson's psychosocial perspective. And Erickson built on Freud's ideas and extended his theory by stressing the psychosocial aspects of development beyond early childhood. The psychosocial stages refer to Erickson's basic psychological and social tasks, which individuals need to master at intervals from infancy through old age. This stage perspective provides the counselor with the conceptual tools for understanding key developmental tasks characteristic of the various stages of life. Erickson's theory of development holds that psychosexual growth and psychosocial growth take place together. He describes development in terms of the entire lifespan, divided by specific crises to be resolved. So, according to 
Erickson, a crisis is equivalent to a turning point when we have a potential to move forward or to regress. At these turning points, we can either resolve our conflicts or fail to master the developmental task. To a large extent, our life is the result of the choices we make at each stage, at each of these stages. Erickson believed Freud did not go far enough in explaining the ego's place in development and did not give enough attention to social influences throughout the lifespan. So while Freud focused on the unconscious, Erickson focused on the social influences. And you'll see um, on the right hand side that chart there will give you a very good summary of Erickson's psychosocial changes and crises. The key needs and developmental tasks along with the challenges inherent at each stage of life provide a model for understanding some of the conflicts clients explore in their therapy sessions. Psychosocial theory gives special weight to childhood and adolescent factors that are significant in later stages of development while recognizing that the later stages also have their significant crises. Themes and threads can be found running throughout clients' lives that have serious implications for counselors. So, you know, the, the idea of being exclusively Freudian can limit how much you can help your client. It's important to bring other factors into uh, the theoretical approach you utilize. And remember, we talked about integration already because everything over our lifetime has a potential to impact how we work in the world. So here's a chart that compares Freud and Erickson. So our first year of life, Freud is the oral stage and later personality problems can include mistrust of others, rejecting others, love and fear of in or inability to form intimate relationships. For Erickson, the crisis is infancy, which is trust versus mistrust. And basically what that means is that can the infant trust its environment? So if he or she is crying, will mom or dad come and pick them up? If their diaper is wet, will they get changed? If they're hungry, will they be fed? So these kinds of simple tasks will build trust between the caregiver and the child. Ages one to three or 18 months to three is your anal stage. And for Freud, and this is the formation of personality in a lot of ways. For Erickson, this is called our early childhood and there's a lot of autonomy versus shame and doubt. Autonomy being independent. So if we become, if we find potty training fairly successful, it's not a big deal. We're not yelled at, we're not screamed at, we're not punished for wetting the bed then we're going to develop in a sense of independence. Whereas if we're yelled at and screamed at and punished, we're going to develop a sense of shame and doubt, especially about our bodies. Then ages three to six is the phallic stage for Freud. And this conflict unconscious incestuous desires that child develops for parents of the opposite sex. The male phallic stage, known as the Oedipus complex, involves mother as the love object for boys. And the female phallic stage, known as the Electra complex, involves girls striving for father's love and approval. So when we talk about sexual desire, we're not talking about adult sexual desire. We're talking about the idea of a five-year-old thinking how much better life would be if that dumb mom would just go away and daddy and her could hang out together and have fun. She's not thinking of necessarily having sex with him, just being his companion. Preschool for Erickson is the stage from three to six, and this is where they learn initiative versus guilt, which is the idea of trying something and being successful at it, or trying something and not being successful at it. Um, you know, you want to make sure that your child has lots of opportunities to try different things so that they have an opportunity to assess 
how successful they can be at any given item and also to, to try and explore beyond the comfort boundaries. Moving on, ages 6 to 12 for Freud is called the latency stage and um, this is when the interests in school, playmates, sports, and a range of new activities and forms relationships with others tends to be same gender relationships. Boys play with boys, girls play with girls, dad and the son are closer, mom and the daughter are closer. Erickson, school age, industry versus inferiority, which refers to goal setting, the ability to accomplish something. Um, failure to do so results in a sense of inadequacy. They learn that failure is an option and that um, if not properly coached, they are allowed to fail all the time. Then ages 16 and we'll go to 18, we have our genital stage, which is adolescence. And these are the old themes of phallic stage are revived in terms of boys like girls, girls like boys, but instead of it being about uh, our parents, it is about our peers. And then for Freud, pretty much anything after 18 is irrelevant for him. He doesn't really look at that. Whereas um, for Erickson, adolescence, 12 to 18, is a time of identity. Um, you figure, fix your identity versus identity confusion, meaning, you know, there's some kids who go from being a jock to a brain to a goth to a druggie, to whatever. They just can't figure out who they really are. They're trying to find their authentic self. Um, and then Erickson continues on for four more stages with young adulthood where intimacy versus isolation, meaning the primary goal from 18 to 35 is to find a mate, a love-based relationship. And if intimacy can lead to isolation and um, if it's not, if a person has not learned how to take criticism, if they haven't learned how to negotiate and compromise. Middle age, generativity versus stagnation, which is a uh, idea that we as people in our middle age, are we going to just stay home, sit on the couch and be a bump on a log or are we going to continue to be productive in our later years and then towards the end of our our retirement time integrity versus despair meaning you know we move on to this idea of are we going to look back on our life with regret or despair or are we going to look back on our life and say hey we did a pretty ha we had a pretty good life things worked out pretty well and that's where Erickson um, sees development really ending is when we die. So we continue to develop through our entire life. Although many find Freud's psychosexual concepts of value, adding Erickson's emphasis on psychosocial factors gives a more complete picture of the critical turning points at each stage of development. Integrating these two perspectives is most useful for understanding key themes in the development of personality. Erickson's developmental schema does not avoid the psychosexual development throughout life. His perspective integrates psychosexual and psychosocial concepts without diminishing the importance of either. So here's a very famous quote by Eric Erickson who uh, is looking a little disheveled in this picture. Uh, life doesn't make any sense without interdependence. We need each other. And the sooner we learn that, the better for us all. Meaning that social experience is what defines us as humans. So let's talk about classical psychoanalysis. And this is where we get real Freudian on you. The two goals of Freudian psychoanalytic therapy are to make the unconscious conscious and to strengthen the ego so that the behavior is based more on reality and less on instinctual cravings or irrational guilt. In classical psychoanalysis, analysts assume an anonymous, non-judgmental stance, which is sometimes called the blank screen approach. 
they avoid self-disclosure and maintain a sense of neutrality to foster a transference relationship in which the clients will make projections onto them. There's a picture of Freud looking very neutral. This transference relationship is a cornerstone of psychoanalysis and refers to the transfer of feelings originally experienced in an early relationship to other important people in a person's present environment. Establishing a therapeutic alliance is a primary treatment goal and repairing damaged alliances is essential if therapy is to progress. One of the central functions of the analyst is to teach clients the meaning of these process through interpretation so that they are able to achieve insight into their problems, increase their awareness of ways to change, and thus gain more control over their lives. A primary aim of psychodynamic approaches is to foster the capacity of clients to solve their own problems. If the therapist pushes the client too rapidly or offers ill-timed interpretations, therapy will not be effective. In classical psychoanalysis, clients must be willing to commit themselves to an intensive long-term therapy process. The analyst remains non-judgmental, listening carefully and asking questions and making interpretations as the analysis progresses. Every intervention by the therapist is made to further the client's progress. Um, and you'll notice there's the couch and um, even though, you know, today a lot of the psychotherapists don't use couches per se, um, strict Freudians do believe that they should use a couch to uh, create distance between eye contact and s physical um, interaction. So moving on to the psychodynamic therapy, which emerged as a way of shortening and simplifying the lengthy process of classical psychoanalysis. They do not use the techniques associated with classical analysis. Traditional analytic therapists make more frequent interpretations of transferences and engage in fewer supportive interventions than do psychodynamic therapists. The notion of never becoming completely free of past experiences has significant implications for therapists who become intimately involved in the unresolved conflicts of their clients. Countertransference is viewed as a phenomenon that occurs when there is inappropriate emotions, when therapists respond in irrational ways, or when they lose their objectivity in a relationship because their own conflicts are triggered. Countertransference consists of a therapist's unconscious emotional responses to a client based on the therapist's own past, resulting in a distorted perception of the client's behavior. So it's uh, counter transference is really the problem of the therapist. It's not the problem of the client. So let's examine the differences between psychodynamic and psychoanalysis techniques. The therapy has more has more to be to limited objectives than restructuring one's personality. So again, psychodynamic is going to be much more limited. The therapist is less likely to use the couch. There's going to be fewer sessions each week. There is more frequent use of supportive interventions such as reassurance, expressions of empathy and support, and suggestions. There is more emphasis on the here and now relationship between therapist and client. There is more latitude for therapist self-disclosure without polluting the transference. Less emphasis is given to the therapist's neutrality. There is a focus on mutual transference and counter-transference enactments. The focus is more on pressing practical concerns than on working with fantasy material. So it's kind of, uh, if you think of it as a um, brief way of solving a long-term problem, that's not to solve the long-term problem, but will temporarily allay some of the immediate symptoms. 
So let's talk about the techniques of psychoanalytic therapy. And these are aimed at increasing awareness, fostering insights into the client's behavior, and understanding the meanings of symptoms. The techniques include maintaining the analytic framework. And this refers to a whole range of procedural and stylistic factors, such as the analyst's relative anonymity, maintaining neutrality and objectivity, the regularity and consistency of meetings, starting and ending the sessions on time, clarity on fees, and basic boundary issues such as the avoidance of advice giving or imposition of the therapist's values, free association and transference. Clients lie on a couch and engage in free association. That is, they try to say whatever comes to mind without self-censorship. This process of free association is known as the fundamental rule. Free association is one of the best tools used to open the doors to unconscious wishes, fantasies, conflicts, and motivations. This technique often leads to some recollection of past experiences and, at times, with the release of intense feelings that comes with free association. The therapist's task is to identify the repressed material that is locked in the unconscious. Interpretation consists of the analyst explaining and even teaching the client the meaning of behavior that is manifested in dreams, free association, resistance defenses, and the therapeutic relationship itself. The functions of interpretation are to enable the ego to assimilate new material and to speed up the process of uncovering further unconscious material. It is important that interpretations be appropriately timed because the client will reject therapist interpretations that are poorly timed. Dream analysis is an important procedure for uncovering unconscious material and giving the client in insight into some areas of unresolved problems. Freud sees dreams as the royal road to the unconscious, for in, in them one's unconscious wishes, needs, and fears are expressed. Dreams have two levels of content. Latent content consists of hidden, symbolic, and unconscious motives, wishes, and fears. Because they are so painful and threatening, the unconscious sexual and aggressive impulses that make up latent contact are transferred, formed into the less threatening manifest content called dream work. In dream work, the therapist does not analyze the person's dreams or provide a clear interpretation. During a dream work session, while the dreamer is sharing a dream, the therapist may ask probing questions in order to gather as much information as possible. Only after all the material has been explored does the therapist share any reactions to the content, symbols, or imagery discussed. Then we have resistance. Is anything that works against the progress of therapy and prevents the client from producing previously unconscious material? Specifically, resistance is the client's reluctance to bring to the surface of awareness unconscious material that has been repressed. Resistance refers to any idea, attitude, feeling, or action, conscious or unconscious, that fosters the status quo and gets in the way of change. During free association or association to dreams, the client may evidence an unwillingness to relate certain thoughts, feelings, and experiences. Freud viewed resistance as an unconscious dynamic that people use to defend against the intolerable anxiety and pain that would arise if they were to become aware of their repressed impulses and feelings. Interpreting transference is a route to revealing the client's intrapsychic life. Clients can recognize how they are repeating the same patterns in their relationships with the therapist, with significant figures from the past, and in present relationships with significant others. Although appropriate interpretations and working through of these current expressions of early feelings, 
clients are able to become aware of and to gradually change some of the long-standing patterns of behavior. The analysis of transference is a central technique in both classical psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic-oriented therapy, for it allows clients to achieve here and now insight into the influence of the past on their present functioning. I'm going to move on to Carl Jung and his analytical psychology. Jung's theory is an elaborate explanation of human nature that combines ideas from history, mythology, anthropology, and religion. Jung made huge contributions to our deep understanding of the human personality and personal development, particularly during Middle Age. Jung's pioneering work places central importance on the psychological changes that are associated with midlife. He maintained that at midlife we need to let go of many of the values and behaviors that guided the first half of our life and confront our unconscious. The task facing us during the midlife period is to be less influenced by rational thought and to instead give expression to these unconscious forces and integrate them into our conscious life. We can best do this by paying attention to the messages of our dreams and by engaging in creative activities such as writing or painting. Jung maintained that we are not merely shaped by past events, otherwise known as Freudian determinism, but that we are influenced by our future as well as our past. Achieving individuation, which is the harmonious integration of the conscious and unconscious aspects of personality, is an innate and primary goal according to Jung. Jung referred to the collective unconscious as the deepest and least accessible level of the psyche, which contains the accumulation of inherited experiences of human and pre-human species. I just saw my typo there. The images of universal experiences contained in the collective unconscious are called archetypes. Among the most important archetypes are the persona, the anima, and the shadow. The persona is a mask or public face that we wear to protect ourselves. The animus and the anima both represent the biological and psychological aspects of masculinity and femininity which are thought to coexist in both sexes. The shadow has the deepest roots and is the most dangerous and powerful of the archetypes. It represents our dark side, the thoughts, feelings, and actions that we tend to disown by projecting them outward. Young wrote that dreams have two purposes. One, they help people prepare themselves for the experiences and events they anticipate in the near future. Two, they also serve a comp compensatory function, working to bring about a balance between opposites within the person. They compensate for the overdevelopment of one facet of the individual's personality. Jung dream, viewed dreams more as an attempt to express than as an attempt to repress and disguise. Dreams are a creative effort that ultimately will lead to resolution and integration. Other types of psychoanalysis include ego psychology, which is part of classical psychoanalysis with the emphasis placed on the vocabulary of id, ego, and superego, and on Anna Freud's identification of defense mechanisms. Anna Freud was Sigmund's daughter. Object relations theory encompasses the work of a number of rather different psychoanalytic theorists who are especially concerned with investigating attachment and separation. Object relations place an emphasis on the cultural dimension, noting that the caregiver's quality should reflect the particular culture in which the person lives. Different cultures maintain different values, so there can be no objective psychic truths. Self-psychology emphasizes how we use interpersonal relationships or self-objects to develop our own self sense of self. So by interacting with others, we develop our own identity. 
The relational model is based on the assumption that the therapy is an interactive process between client and the therapist. Relational analysts put focus, put value on not knowing and approach clients with genuine curiosity. The task of relational analysis is to explore each client's life in a creative way customized to the therapist and client working together in a particular at a moment in time. Most contemporary psychoanalytic theories center on predictable developmental sequences in which the early experiences of the self shift in relation to an expanding awareness of others. Once self-other patterns are established, it is assumed they influence later in interpersonal relationships. Specifically, people search for relationships that match the patterns established by their earlier experiences. People who are either overly dependent or overly detached, for example, can be repeating patterns of relating they established with their mother when they were toddlers. Margaret Mailer had a central influence on contemporary object relations theory. She is a pediatrician who focused on the observation of children, especially on the interactions between the child and the mother in the first three years of life. Mahler called the first three or four weeks of life normal infantile autism. Mahler believes the infant is unable to differentiate itself from its mother in many respects at this age. So basically, the infant sees itself as an extension of the mother. Mahler's next phase, called symbiosis, is recognized by the third month and extends roughly through the eighth month. At this age, the infant has a pronounced dependency on the mother. She, or the primary caregiver, is clearly a partner and not just an interchangeable part. The infant seems to expect a very high degree of emotional attunement with its mothers. The separation individuation process begins in the fourth or fifth month. The child experiences separation from significant others, yet still turns to them for a sense of confirmation and comfort. Moving on to brief psychodynamic therapy, or BPT, which applies the principles of psychodynamic theory and therapy to treat selective disorders within a pre-established time limit of generally 10 to 25 sessions. Most forms of the time-limited dynamic approach call upon quickly formulating a therapeutic focus such as a th central theme or problem area. Some possible goals of this approach might include conflict resolution, greater access to feelings, increasing choice possibilities, improving interpersonal relationships, and symptom remission. This strategy emphasizes that the aim of time-limited dynamic therapy is not to bring about a cure, but to foster changes in behavior, thinking, and feeling. This is accomplished by using the client-therapist relationship as a way to understand how the person interacts in the world. It is assumed that clients interact with the therapist in the same dysfunctional ways they interact with significant others. Brief dynamic therapy tends to emphasize a client's strengths, competencies, and resources in dealing with real-life issues. A major modification of the psychoanalytic technique is the emphasis on the here and now of the client's life rather than exploring the there and then of childhood. BPT is an opportunity to begin the process of change which continues long after therapy is terminated. Short-term treatments are based on conceptual approaches similar to those of long-term therapy, but the techniques used are different. Rather than asking clients to free associate, practitioners ask questions, are more direct and confrontational, and deal quickly with transference issues. There are a number of practical limitations of psychoanalytic therapy. Considering factors such as time, expense, and availability of trained psychoanalytic therapists, the practical applications of many psychoanalytic techniques are limited. This is especially true of methods such as free association on the couch, 
dream analysis, and extensive analysis of the transference relationship. A major limitation of traditional psychoanalytic therapy is the relatively long time commitment required to accomplish analytic goals. Traditional psychoanalytic approaches are costly and psychoanalytic therapy is generally perceived as being based on upper and middle class, class values. Ambiguity can be problematic for clients from cultures who expect direction from a professional. For example, Asian American clients may prefer a more structured, directive, problem-oriented approach to counseling and may not continue therapy. Psychoanalytic therapy is generally more concerned with long-term personality reconstruction than with short-term problems of living. And from a multicultural perspective, Erickson has made significant contributions to how social and cultural factors affect people in many cultures over the lifespan. Psychotherapists need to recognize and confront their own potential sources of bias and how countertransference could be conveyed unintentionally through their interventions, including prejudices and racial or ethnic stereotypes. So that's it for today's presentation. If you have any questions, please email or text us. If you are not in a class at the college, please feel free to leave a comment and we will get back to you as quickly as we can. Thank you and have a fabulous day.